All right. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here with Christina and from 10, Drawing 10,000 Birds. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're up to. Well, hey, everyone. So great to be here tonight. Thanks so much for having me on your show, Marley. Um, I am happily enjoying the beginnings of spring migration here in New York. And as always, trying to see and draw and paint every single bird in the world, which is a very time-consuming, long-term project. So it's always, always something I, ha I have on the to-do list, probably till the day I die. Wow, that is that is that is so cool. So, um, like, how did you even come up with this idea in the first place? Well, I always loved drawing and and just like painting animals ever since I was a little kid, always until, and then when I was um, in college, I went to Bard College in the Hudson Valley. It was the first time in my life I was living in a more rural area. So mm -hmm. instead of uh, going and looking at books and, and sort of vicariously uh, seeing what other people had seen and drawing that, I was able to see like cool wildlife things for the first time myself, like in, in the wild as opposed to a zoo. And I had this professor who was just starting to bird and we were canoeing for credit that day, which I always think is just the coolest. And uh, she ended up being my partner in the canoe because we had an uneven num number of people in class. And I was trying not to crash us into a bunch of rocks while she was trying to show me uh, a yellow warbler, which was something I had no idea existed. And while I didn't crash us into the rocks, I also didn't see the yellow warbler. Uh, when, when I ran back to my room to figure out what I had missed, and I noticed that this beautiful, gorgeous, little yellow orb of joy existed, and I hadn't known about it for 20 years. I was like, oh my God, what else have I been missing? Um, so then I decided I had to go try to find even more birds. And then I read a book called Kingbird Highway by Ken Kaufman, which is a, a super fantastic book. But if you read it, uh, with the right mindset could lead you to do some pretty stupid things. Uh, he, he was this great birder who tried to see as many birds as he could in a, in a big year uh, across, the, across the United States. And he did it by spending $1,000 and hitchhiking and, and just like eating cat food, living under bridges. And after I read that, I was like, okay, I have all of that plus technology. So I'm gonna go and I don't wanna eat cat food, but I'm gonna go and try to see all the birds, but wait, I'm also gonna try to see every bird. So instead of just the North American birds, I decided why not go try to see all the birds and that's where I am now. Wow, that that is amazing. Um, I'm just gonna take a moment here to say hi to all the people that I see in the comments. So hi, Ivea, Jean, Eli, um, thanks for joining in and everybody who's not posting in the comments, thanks for joining in. Uh, just getting started here. Um, with Christina and so excited about this mission of yours. It seems so ambitious um, and to take it to the next level of not just seeing those birds but painting them also is so cool. So could you um, maybe like for some for a lot of the birders in the audience, there's birders and nature journalers in the audience, um, could you just describe like your ideal birding session? Yeah. Okay, my ideal birding session well, unfortunately, I'm not I'm not really an early bird, but every birding session that's, you know, magical has to start at like 5 a.m. So I get up at 5 a.m., I have an amazing breakfast ready for me, and I get out the door, and it's the spring, because spring migration is, in my opinion, the best time of the year. And, you know, I, I like the, the appeal of going somewhere cool and exotic, but honestly, one of the most magical things in the world for me is to go out, step outside the door in the, in the um, Northeastern United States, like the first week of May when all the wood warblers are just coming in and everything is singing, all the flowers are out and it smells amazing. And you just walk out and it's like the world is pulsing around you and there are just this wonderful little blobs of color everywhere and it's just magical. Nice, that is awesome. And that reminds me of some of your, the, the uh, magical blobs of color reminds me of um like one of your paintings so could you show people do you have any artwork around you that you could yes. show us to give people a feeling for for some of the painting that you're doing yes i have um i have some i don't have the magical blobs. i should have had the magical blobs but that one's really um, cool people have to I check have, it out on your website i have some warbler blobs here that i was doing i just these aren't as blobby as i can get but mm -hmm. i threw a whole bunch of paint of yellow paint because i love yellow it makes me really happy yeah. Through a whole bunch of yellow paint. And then I just uh, brought the birds out of that yellow because I, I wanted the, the color to pretty much guide the, 
the feeling of the birds and I wanted them to just be joyous and excited. Nice. Nice. That's so, super cool. Um, so, uh, so let me ask you this, and this is something like, you know, you might be preaching to the choir a little bit here, but like, why do you think, why did you decide to combine birding and art or vice versa? That's a good question. Uh, in the beginning, it wasn't really a conscious decision. When mm -hmm. I first, I mean, I've always drawn what interested me. I mean, I went through a dragon phase and an anime phase when that was what was like cool in high school. And uh, when I was going out and looking at all these birds, um, you know, I'd have a camera, I'd take some pictures because at that point I was just a baby birder and I barely even had binoculars that worked. And in order to go home and figure out what I'd seen, I it was really helpful to have pictures. But uh, to fill in the gaps, I would also just like draw what I had seen, even if I didn't remember it perfectly. And I realized, you know, a while later that by drawing all the birds I was seeing, uh, whether from memory or from photos, it was actually really cementing so many of those key field marks and identifiers, whether it was posture or just the feeling I got from the birds, the time of year it was. And so I realized that uh, while I thoroughly enjoyed birding and I thoroughly enjoyed painting by putting them together, um, it was making me a better birder. So I think, you know, birders and artists, uh, if you do both, you have a big advantage because it, it, you actually improve in both areas by the practice of both. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and that's interesting to hear that your method was mostly um, drawing like when you got home, because that I find like that's really has been really hard for me to do and to even practice that. Like even um, even if I'm using like a scope and going back and forth between looking through the scope and drawing the bird, it's um, like I have a I do this thing with my I use these small binoculars and I, I do a thing where I can hold them like this in a way where I can just like really easily look back and forth. But like with the scope, just even of a fraction of a second longer between looking at the bird and trying to draw it, I find makes it so much harder um, to remember those. So like tell tell us a little bit more about your process, like from birding to painting, like what does that look like? Well, one confession I have to make is that I am not, how should I put this? I, I don't follow a lot of like, I, like, I don't know if you've ever seen this book, but like I love um, Muir's Laws' nature book mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. nature journaling. And everything he says to do when you're outside and you're, you know, actually drawing outside, I don't do. <laughs> so uh -huh. uh, when I'm outside, um, and let me find my stack of stuff here. I think I put my, yes. So when I go outside and I'm gonna draw outside, I usually have this nifty little watercolor box that's just sits like right in my pocket and is super tiny. Yeah. And has a little watercolor brush so that I don't have to have a very big setup. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, there's a part of me that wishes I could be one of those really great nature journalists that sits outside and just mm -hmm. draws the birds like in the field. But the birder in me always is sort of taking over. It makes it really hard to focus on getting the birds you know, drawn in the field when I just mm -hmm. want to identify the bird and then move on to the next bird. So when I'm in the field and I'm drawing and painting, what I'll often do is I'll just do very quick little gestures of the birds or I will write down the feelings that I had about the birds mm -hmm. and the specific, uh, uh, the specific occasions so that I can remember that emotion that I'll want to portray later. And I'll maybe I'll, I'll paint the backgrounds and the landscape. Um, but then I don't really go back and draw in the birds until I'm sitting in my studio. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, one day, one day I'll get there. But for now, I think just in order to be happy birding and then be happy painting, I kind of separate the two mm -hmm. for, for now. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And that's something that I've, I think a lot of everybody is experiencing in some to some degree or another. I, I talked to um, Timothy Joe, I think three weeks ago, and he was talking about this this question of like um, combining birding and art. And he was he was I, I also asked him. Well, actually, before I give you his answer, let me ask you this question is um, like, and you, you might have said a little bit of this already, but um, why would you recommend that other birders try drawing? I think, you know, I, I, I love to ask this question when I'm teaching a, a class, you know, how many of you know, like what a Carolina Wren's foot looks like? And I asked really serious birders, like, can you describe the color of a Carolina wren's foot to me? Or like any bird, you know, a robin, a blue jay, something super simple you see every day. 
and a lot of them can't remember. And the, and the reality is, you know, when you're birding, you look for the key field marks that help you ID the bird and you look for, you know, the things that are really interesting. Like I always find myself drawn to the eyes, the colors, the face, but I think we, I mean, I think a lot of us just forget to look at those little details like feet or, you know, mm -hmm. specific way the beak is shaped. And if you, but if you're drawing it, if you want to draw it, you know, as accurately as possible, I mean, maybe you don't, but if you do want to draw it accurately, you have to look at those things. You can't mm -hmm. just, you know, you can't just get to the end and get to the feet and be like, oh darn, I just am gonna wing it. Uh, so drawing the bird forces you to look at all of those aspects and make a, a, you know, put them all together as a whole instead of just picking and choosing the parts that, you know, help you identify it in the field. Which I think is really so important. It so it sounds like um, drawing and art um, can help you go deeper with your birding do you think going deeper is what most birders want to do? Okay, I can't speak for all birders, but yeah, I think most birders really do want to go deeper. I know there's uh -huh. some people who are just very content to just enjoy. And I and I love that too. Yeah. I think there are days when you just sort of watch the birds and and that's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, I, I have to admit, like a lot of the birders I spend time with and, and that, I mean, I am like this myself. <laughs> I'm constantly always wanting to try to go really hard and obsessively at it. Yeah. Okay. So I guess maybe I should be a little bit more uh, precise in my wording of that. Okay. Um, and, and maybe I can use my hands to sort of, so do you think, um, uh, do you think most birders, like, I mean, compared to like going deeper, what about like seeing more birds? Like, do you think those things are at odds with each other? Like, learning what the foot of the Carolina Wren looks like, do you think that will prevent me from seeing um, five other like Wren species or like a couple warblers that maybe I would miss if I'm like looking at the foot of one of them? You know, I think birding is a lifelong thing. So my answer to that is no. I think the more time you spend looking at a Carolina Wren's foot, the more different kinds of wrens you'll eventually see because you'll be able to discern the differences and know where to look for each one because you've spent so much time looking at one Carolina warbler, I'm sorry, Carolina Wren, mm -hmm. that you know, then it's much easier to discern when it's not a Carolina Wren and you'll Got be it. able to know what the others are so much more easily. Got it, okay, great. That was sort of a, a pardon the sort of devil's advocate um, question there. So um, tell us a little bit more about your mission and um, this number. How about start off by talking about this number? Because I did notice some people were kind of like, oh, I thought it was 9,600 or, you know, so like, talk. can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, like these estimates? I'm sure you've done some research about this uh, more than I have, but um, some of these like estimates about how many birds there are supposed to be and maybe the significance of, of that 10,000 sure sounds like a very round uh, number. Well, aside from the fact that it is a very nice round number, I mean, no one would ever email me if they had to type in drawing <laughs> 9,361 birds. Um, but uh, when I, I, uh, I did karate for a long time uh, and my teacher always told me that um, you know, you'll never actually learn know how to punch until you punch 10,000 times. Uh, and that always sort of stuck in the back of my head. And I, I don't actually know the exact number of bird species there are at this moment, because they're always splitting them and, and lumping them. And uh, But I know there are around 10,000. There's actually a great book called 10,000 Birds. Um, wow. And so when I was thinking about, you know, what I wanted to do with my life, I, I thought it was very, um, I thought it was very poetic, but also kind of a very, fulfilling thing that uh, there were 10,000 birds and in order to, you know, ever really know something, you have to do it 10,000 times. And at that point I'd seen enough birds to have realized that going after birds was making my life freaking awesome. So in my head I thought, okay, by the time I see 10,000 birds, A, I'll really know how to see birds. By the time I paint 10,000 birds, I really know how to paint 10,000 birds. And my life will be so freaking amazing that since it'll probably take me my whole life, I can just sort of pass on fulfilled and it'll all just be great. So it seemed like the perfect number. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is in a way, this um, some, maybe an even arbitrary num numeric kind of quantifiable thing provides this really clear sort of like 
um, compass um, that then has all of these, that makes it really easy to know like what you're doing, but then it has all of these other sort of like side benefits that come from that. Yeah, the side benefits are amazing. Uh, when I was still in college, I was applying for this fellowship called the Watson Fellowship where you could propose like your wildest fantasy uh, and, and, to, and it had to be involved traveling abroad for a year. You couldn't come back to the United States. You had to be abroad for an entire year doing some kind of really cool project and you'd get a ton of money. And uh, while well, I didn't get it, I got to the final round. And one of the questions I was asked was, is it more important to you uh, to see 10,000 birds or have really great experiences with like 10 birds? Mm. And I remember thinking, wow, that's a really good question. But I already knew the answer because, you know, I, that little yellow warbler that had gotten me hooked and then I had my turkey vulture friend behind me. Like I spent all these time. I just, I just knew that, you know, it was more important to really enjoy the experience uh, than it necessarily was to see every bird. I'd love to see every bird. I think that'd be great. Um, but it was definitely about really appreciating the birds and getting to know them and trying to help protect them. And, and along the ways I've gone to meet all these birds, I met some of the coolest people and seen some really cool stuff. I even met my partner at a bird festival. So, I mean, the fringe benefits are, you know, all over the place. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, could you talk a little bit more about some of those things that, because you've already traveled um, quite a bit, I think, on in on this mission. So, can you talk a little bit more about some of these these side things that you've gotten out of it? So far, you've mentioned, um, like, community and meeting awesome people. What are some of the other, like, cool, um, unexpected benefits? Well, I think... You know, I mentioned meeting really awful, really awesome, not awful, well, awesome people, really good community. And that's one I'd like to just go a little deeper on because I think a lot of people who maybe you're more interested in, in art or a little quieter or just, you know, more scientific things tend to be, you know, labeled growing up as, you know, nerds or weird or you're not necessarily the cool kids. But when I discovered the birding community, it was the first time in my life I was like, oh, my God. Like there's more of us. There's all these nerds and all they want to do is talk about birds all day. And like every single conversation is, you know, what you saw in the morning, what you saw for, during lunch, you know, you eat while you go see birds, you get birds all day long. And it was just, this is the greatest thing ever. So that was just, I think aside from, you know, the community and, and the travel and I think that a feeling, that feeling of acceptance and belonging was, yeah. Belonging, wow. Really a powerful thing that birds have given me. That is so cool. I think people get that out of the Nature Journal community a lot too. And, um, you know, a lot of times people, like they find out about nature journaling and maybe it's something they've kind of been doing already. They just didn't know that there was like a community and sort of like a name for it. And there's just this like light that turns on inside of them when they realize like, oh yeah, there's all these people like, like me. So that's that's really cool to hear about the belonging and the um, community part. So, what is um, what are some of the coolest places that you've been so far? That's a really fun question. So, hands down, the coolest place I've ever been is the Galapagos, and that was like that was an opportunity that was like winning the lottery at age twenty five. I had a, a co I had a, a colleague who couldn't go on a trip that was leaving in eight days and couldn't get, and didn't have trip insurance. So she just gave it to me because she was the only person she knew who could like take off from work for two weeks on eight days notice. And it was the best. Um, but I've also, I just went to Japan um, in 2019 before COVID uh, for some like grant research. And it was like, Japan was one of the coolest places ever. I have to say the, the, between all the, temples and shrines and, and the birds on the temples and shrines and the birds around all the mountains. It was just, it was just amazing. Cool. What were some of your favorite species in Japan? Oh man, the, uh, the Japanese paradise flycatcher, which you should all go look up because it is just wild. Um, has a really, really long purple tail and the male has these big blue eyes. Um, that was really cool. And I have to, it's not, it's a, it's a little bit off topic, but I also then went to Seoul right afterward and to Korea. Uh -huh. And yeah. then this little island called Jeju, where my friend uh, works at a boarding school, she, uh, fig she asked, she figured out 
how to go find me this rare, rare, rare bird called a fairy pitta that just about made my year. It's this little- Oh, I saw your thing. painting of that. It is the cool, it's this little rainbow magical thing that just is uh -huh. like in the dark forest and suddenly it just popped up, rainbow gone. I was just nice. like, wow. That, that is that's the show I look up to. That's a really pretty bird. Wow, that's awesome. I'm gonna uh, look over here at the comments and see, I think people have posted some, um, questions. I just want to give a little love to the community here. Um, um, Ivea is commenting about your the painting that you showed earlier and um, okay. and then um, Andrew is commenting about spring migration in San Diego which is definitely a little warmer than uh, <laughs> New York. Um, uh let's see here um there was a question here let, let's see what you here's a question from Ivea. is there a particular thing where i enjoy burning the most yes you know i no matter where i go uh birding in the deciduous forests of uh new york is always going to be my favorite place to go birding uh mm -hmm. i like to describe the feeling of birding uh in these forests as that feeling of you know, coming home for the holidays and seeing all your family and all your loved ones after you haven't seen them for a while and just feeling like it's a, it's a giant hug. Oh, that's that's so cool how we can connect with um, those, uh, you know, that aspect of nature. Um, okay, this is so cool. I feel like we could talk about your, um, your, your big mission um, forever. Um, but I wanted to hear a little bit more about specifically about the Galapagos because there was actually a nature journaling group that, um, I was going to go on, uh, with John Muir Laws and we were going to bring a bunch of people and it was going to happen last summer. Um, but it got canceled obviously. Um, and so actually got postponed because they couldn't refund the, um, deposits. Um, and so we were all like very excited and, and re doing like research and practicing before the trip and stuff like that. So like give, give us some, there might be some people who are going to go on that trip who are like going to watch this show and, and for them and for me, like, let's hear some, like, could you give a little bit more juicy tidbits about the Galapagos? I definitely can, but I just first have to ask, do you actually know John Muir Laws? Are you going to meet him in person? Yeah. Well, he lives near here. So we're, a lot of us are lucky because we're on the West Coast to be able to go to his classes and stuff. That yeah. is so cool. I'm yeah. really close right now. I'll try to just move on from that and, and unpack that feeling of wow later. But um, <laughs> yeah, cool. So, wow. So if you're going to go to the Galapagos with John Muir Laws, that is going to be like the trip of a lifetime. Because I have to say the Galapagos was, how should I put this? I got off the boat and we got to the first island. And I felt like someone had kicked me in the face if the kick in the <laughs> face was like an explosion of just shock and joy. And I can't believe this is real because there was like a Galapagos sea lion literally in the path in front of me, swallows hell gulls just about hitting me in the head. All of these, just iguanas running here and blue footed boobies over here. They were all like 10 feet away. They didn't care that we were there. And it was like no one else in the world but us. And it was like I'd suddenly landed in David Attenborough's like David Attenborough's thing, except it was me, and I, I don't have an accent, and I just had it was my mind was just all over the place, and just thinking about it clearly makes my mind go all over the place. Um, it's really indescribable to just suddenly be so close to all these creatures that you you know are are, are the subject of David Attenborough's planet Earth and and life, and yeah. suddenly you're there and you're part of it. So how long was the were you, how long was the trip? So I was there for two weeks. Um, I was there with a group that was aimed at bird at specifically birding. Oh, uh -huh. um, so although we obviously looked for for all the wildlife, but we also had people who you know were, were real diehards. We went to look for you know the endemics like Galapagos rail and uh, mm -hmm. all the the mockingbirds is particularly the one that's critically endangered. Um, we went to almost all the islands except for one. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what that one was. It was one that didn't have any important birds on it. Yeah. Um, and I was there in November. So it was uh, when we were scuba diving, which was also just unbelievable. Not scuba diving, just, just regular diving. 
-hmm. snorkeling that's the one just regular snorkeling uh i remember jumping in the water and screaming because it was so cold yeah wow dang that sounds awesome two weeks and going to all the islands that sounds like even more in depth than the uh the itinerary that um we have planned for going to the galapagos um that's that's really cool and that also the mention of the endangered mockingbird um brings up something that i wanted to ask you about in relationship to your project how do you um how do you conceive of your project in relationship to um species loss and um loss of biodiversity which you know like the last person i talked to um dion dior in australia said that we have the, I think the word she used, um, she said, um, oh, she said we have like the obligation as uh, people who are living in this time to um, document in some way, in the way that we can, the biodiversity because, you know, with species loss and um, habitat loss being so extreme right now that a lot of those things are gonna be gone. So like, how do you, if at all, I don't want to like put uh, words into your mouth, but like, is your project related at all to to species loss? And if so, how do you conceive of that connection? Well, you know, it's not. I, there's a part of me that uh, very much is aware of the fact that, you know, as time goes on, a lot of these species will probably be lost. You know, I of course don't want that to happen you know, a big part of my mission is to show people what we do have, you know, now as an effort to get them to be really excited about it and want to do something about it. But, you know, in terms of the fact that inevitably it seems some of these species will be lost, um, I, I do think it is very important to at least, you know, I, I think very as nature journalists and, and just artists in general, a big part of what we do is tell stories. So I think being able to um, record some of these birds and my own experiences with them is is perhaps a way to be able to tell those stories to perhaps inspire you know whoever comes next to to try to protect what still is there and to at least respect what what we've lost. Um, so it, it sounds like what you're saying is you're sort of reframing it and instead of thinking about it in terms of like oh I'm gonna I need to capture these things before they go extinct you're thinking about it as like, oh, I need to show what's there now so that people care enough that more of them don't go extinct. Yeah, I mean, there is this sense of, I, I do want to see certain birds before they go extinct. I actually had this epic adventure to San Francisco to see uh, California condors, uh, just because, mm. you know, while they are luckily on, on recovering, there is this part of me that, you know, was worried that that'd be a bird that if I didn't go there, you know, mm -hmm. you know, something could happen and I'd never, and I'd never see it. Um, mm -hmm. But I also feel like, you know, there's so many, there's so many pros and cons to, to anything nowadays. I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, as much as I'd love to just go off and look for these really rare birds, I have to balance, you know, well, am I, if I go there and I, I, you know, I use the, the fossil fuel to go on that plane and I, I spend the money to go there and I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm part of that, you know, that, that culture that's around it. Um, mm -hmm. Am I going to do something worthwhile with that, 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 you know, sort of makes the cost, um, mm -hmm. that makes the cost okay for some of these more, you know, direly endangered birds. Like what right do I have to go see this bird where there's only 10 left if it's going to infringe upon that bird's safety? So I think there's a lot to, yeah. to consider in all of this. Yeah, that's, that's a, that sounds like you're, uh, you're thinking about it, um, in terms of your responsibility and all that. And that is, a, that all is, is something that I've wondered about too, because I'm interested in nature journaling and endangered ecosystems around the world and um, trying to think about like um, the balance between the benefits that that work could have and my impact, I think is is essential that we think about things that way. Could, could you talk a little bit about any of the other species besides the California condor that you're worried may go extinct before you can um, include them in your project? Well, there's, I mean, the, a lot of uh, species, well, the Galapagos, well, I, well I, I did see them. There was a time where I, I never imagined I would go see them. And, and when you're there, you know, thinking about the lava gull and, you know, the, the Floriana Mockingbird, like the mm -hmm. lava gull, there's only, I think, 500 left. That could mm -hmm. easily be wiped out with, you know, a tsunami. 
Right, right. There, that are those islands alone had plenty of species that could just go out like that. That was, mm -hmm. you know, something for you all to think about while you're there. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, but you know, other birds, um, like a lot of that, I really want to see are in New Zealand. Like uh, the mm -hmm. kakapo, particularly, is it's a big flightless parrot uh, that yeah. is just fantastically round and rotund and adorable. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's definitely high, high, high on my list. Um, a lot of seabirds like albatross mm -hmm. uh you know with with climate change uh their chicks are constantly having trouble reproducing those are high on my list as well um i think yeah a lot of news and now australia with all the fires i think i haven't i don't know all the research on the numbers for that but mm -hmm. i'm sure there's a lot there that are you know not not doing so great anymore yeah but, okay cool great well that i mean that's so interesting and it's also very uh sobering to think about some of those topics and i think um it's important that we do discuss them i read a book recently i don't know if you've read this one um uh, by david Quammen called song of the dodo and it's about island biogeography and it talks about the extinction of the dodo but then it talks about birds on other islands and like for example more bird species have gone extinct in the last hundred years on hawaii than have like gone extinct in like, it, I forget which continents it combined, but compared to continents, island species go extinct really easily. So um, yeah, it's it, it was really, it was a really interesting uh, read there. Um, could you talk any more about like your method on like how you make your art or maybe talk about what, there's some story behind the vulture that's um, sitting behind you? Yeah, so um, I'll just quickly talk about my, my vulture. Yeah. Who's, so this is my um, part of my senior thesis that keeps on giving. Uh -huh. um, back when I was graduating from Bard, I wanted to uh, sort of bring the wildlife around me into the studio so people could see how cool it was. So I made these, uh, what I thought were life-size models. They all turned out bigger because in my head, they're just all larger than life. Um, but since I, I spent a lot of time watching turkey vultures when I was a college student because they were always flying around the athletic fields because there was a dump back there. And it was a very poignant first bird to really start to identify with because I'd always heard of vultures as being these evil things that try to fly around Simba and eat him in the Disney movie. And they're just, you know, terrible and they're ugly and no one likes them. And, but when I watched them, I realized that they're actually unbelievably cute and dorky and they kind of like waddle like this when they walk, which I thought was just adorable. And they're just unbelievably graceful in flight. And in the sunsets, their red heads would just look like they were on fire mm. as they would come into roost. And they were so sweet with each other when like the pairs would preen each other. And it was just so nice that I realized that, you know, vultures were these great example of, of a bird that, you know, just gets looked down on because it looks ugly and no one understands it. And, you know, it real I realized that by watching birds we can learn all of as, as corny as this sounds we can learn all these really great life lessons that actually really apply to people too uh -huh. the turkey vulture always has this near and dear place in my heart cool <laughs> that's yeah i i love vultures also and i think it, it's really funny timothy joe had a thing where he had a turkey vulture coming to his i think he put something out intentionally to feed a feed turkey vultures next to his bird feeder cool. and he, he posted a picture of it and it was just like the cognitive dissonance of like, like I'm someone who, who loves turkey vultures and all that, but it's like, wait, why don't people put, like people put out food for all these other birds, but it's like no one puts out food intentionally for turkey vultures. And even to just talk about it seems so, sort of absurd, but it's like, yeah, why, do, why don't people love turkey vultures? You know, so like you said you got these life lessons or lessons about people from them. What are some of the, are there other examples or like what is the lesson um, that you learned uh, from turkey vultures about people? Well, uh, I think the big takeaway I had from turkey vultures, um, and I think this again kind of tied into, you know, it, it's not always easy being a nerd or just someone who wants to spend more time running outside in the dirt than socializing with people. So watching the turkey vultures and realizing that even though, you know, they weren't necessarily immediately recognized for how great they are, uh, especially considering they clean up after us and they don't kill anything. And they're just like these really fantastic alchemists that like turn, 
you know, all this dead stuff into new energy. Um, it was just this really nice thought of, you know, anyone who's ever really been left out or looked down on, like they, everyone else has that really cool superpower they have too. And everyone's got something to contribute. And the more we realize that, then not only will the more we realize vultures are awesome, but you know, the more we'll be nice to each other and you know, all that kind of corny stuff. Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a great one. And just to, uh, share this comment from Rebecca, she says she doesn't think it's corny. So, uh, well, thanks Rebecca. <laughs> um, and that sort of reminds me of what, um, Dr. Drew Lanham, the, um, one of the blackbirders who's been, uh, has a lot of great videos on YouTube. He has a thing, um, a great video on YouTube, um, where he says like all of the blackbirds are my birds and he identifies with them and he, he says they've also been like, um, you know, wrongly maligned just for the color of their feathers. So, uh, and misunderstood. So, um, I think that's a really cool, cool way to take those lessons from the birds. Um, I love that. All right. So I think it's about time for the lightning round. Are you feeling ready for the lightning round? I'm so ready for the lightning round. Okay, great. Let me turn on the lightning round banner here. Make wow. your best lightning sound. What's your best lightning sound? Pew, pew. Okay, nice. Okay. <laughs> um, first, first question for the lightning round is, is coffee an essential art supply? No, actually. Okay. I'm seeing how long I can go in life before it is. I'm sure it'll happen eventually. Oh, nice. Okay, you're one of the first people that said no to that. Um, so adamantly, uh, do you eat snacks while painting? Oh my gosh, it's terrible. I eat snacks so much while painting that I have to keep a little mini vac on hand to just <laughs> vacuum up all the crumbs. It's yeah, my dog okay. really loves it. That sort of leads into the next question Is your studio or art space messy or organized? <laughs> okay, how should I put this? I think that artists are allowed to have a tendency toward entropy, and I wholeheartedly embrace my entropy. It's okay. chaos, but it's so chaotic. All right, nice nice reframing of that one. Yeah. Um, does your family understand your mission? Most of them. There's this great movie called The Big Year, which I'm sure mm -hmm. a lot of birders have seen, and I actually bought it so that when I had family members who were confused, I just would screen that movie and <laughs> would kind of get it a little. That's great. I wish there was a movie like that that I could use. I know. It really does make it so much more convenient. You get in the right <laughs> mood, you get popcorn. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Now, sure. That's such as... a good trick. I yeah. mean, that's a, that's a, I need to think about that. That could be like a whole company that makes movies like that. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Do you like to bird by yourself or with others? Mm, I, that's a really tough question. I, I think I most often, uh, sorry, this is gonna be that's hard a question. I like doing, I feel like it's two separate activities, which is why I'm having such a hard time. When I bird by, most, by myself, I feel like I'm having introspective meditative time. Whereas when I'm birding with others, it's like a social hour. So yeah. not the same thing at all. And I feel like sometimes I just need to have meditative introverted time. And sometimes I need to socialize. But I don't Great answer. Yeah. I, I uh, respect your ability to like break outside of the bounds of the yes or no question. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, next question, in the lightning round is um, what would be the, what is the Holy grail for you? Of, of, in life or like a bird? Bird, or... Birds, art, either, either way. The Holy grail. Oh, that's such a terribly great question. Um, well, I, I have different levels of holy grails. Okay. Um, I, th I think, I think, um, okay, I actually, okay, I got it. I got my holy grail. Um, that, that fellowship I applied for that I mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. there were, there were six dream birds that I wanted to see above all else. And mm -hmm. so I guess my holy grail in life is, you know, no matter what else, no matter what else I managed to accomplish, I really want to go see those six birds and paint them. Hmm. What are they? They are, and I have seen a couple. Mm -hmm. I've managed to get a couple of them. They are the great gray owl, which I have seen. Um, the Andean condor, which I've also seen. Whoa. Uh, yeah, that was awesome. Um, red naped crane in Japan, which mm -hmm. I haven't seen. I wish wrong season. 
uh, Battle or Eagle in um, South. I've seen that one. You've seen that one? That's yeah. awesome. That one I want to see. And then um, the uh, Tawny Frogmouth in Australia. Oh my God. Is that one of those really camouflaged ones that looks like the tree branch? Oh my gosh. Wow. That one, yes. That would be really fun to draw that one also. Okay. Be, all right. So, great. so the next couple of questions for the lightning round are, um, so when so in an imaginary scenario in the future, you've, you've finished your 10,000 bird project and NASA has just discovered an exoplanet with Earth-like conditions, and um, they've found avian species there, avian-like creatures, um, and they're looking for someone to send there with their research team to create some art depicting those species. Um, but there's a chance, there's like a 50% chance you'd never be able to make it back to Earth. Um, first, would you go? Oh man, I don't think I would go. Okay, good, 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 uh, good job listening to your gut there. And then, if you if you did decide to go, what five art supplies would you take? Okay, if I did go, and believe me, not going would be very difficult for me. Um, I would take my uh, .05 Staedtler uh, technical pencil, my okay. uh, just rubber eraser. Mm -hmm. um, the little watercolor kit I showed you, mm -hmm. um, and a bottle of, wait, I guess I have to have paper. Dang it. Okay, paper. Mm -hmm. Watercolor paper. And mm -hmm. my white gouache. Ooh, okay. Nice. And is that the, um, Koi, is that the Koi watercolor kit that you have? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I don't think I would want to leave Earth either, you know, so... Um, if you could have a birding or art superpower, what superpower would you have? A birding or art superpower. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I think it would be, well, I mean, I think it'd be really cool to be able to uh, perfectly mimic every single bird call and kind of call back to them and have conversations. I have a friend who's a musician who can really kind of do that. And it's, it's just it's really awesome. Nice. That is a good one. And that brings me to the last, um, the last question of the lightning round, which is, um, pishing or no pishing when you're birding? Uh, as a general rule of thumb, I don't pish, um, until I've, uh, just dis discerned whether the situation would be acceptable to do so. I know there, you know, it's always, I feel like it's a very much a, you know, situation by situation. If it's breeding season, I'm not going to pish something off the nest. I'm not going to pish something um, that's going to, I'm not going to pish if it's in any way going to impact the safety of the species. But mm -hmm. if it's an instance where I've never seen the bird and I've determined and, you know, I've determined to the best of my ability, that seems like it'd be okay. I, I might pish a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I like to do to make retributions, I go home and paint it and then I try to get people really excited about it too. <laughs> cool. Okay, great. All right. Good job in the lightning round. That was fun. Yeah. Um, you survived the lightning round. Um, and my last, um, the, my last big question is, um, what do you see as the future of birding? Wow. So I actually, I've been thinking about that a lot recently, considering that, you know, the world might be opening back up soon more with COVID. Um, I think that birding is going to look very different in a few years. I think for a number of reasons. One, simply because uh, in the birding community right now is I think in a lot of communities, there's a huge uh, internal reckoning and, and metamorphosis in terms of diversity and inclusivity and just trying to figure out how to balance um, you know, all those factors and even just in accessibility it's, a, it's amazing how something as simple as going to look at birds um, is not necessarily as accessible as it should be. So I think that's gonna change um, a lot of birding. I think the uh, advent of so much social media and technology in birding is going to really bring in a younger demographic and hopefully get more younger people excited about birding, um, particularly kids. I think it's really cool to get kids excited about birds. Um, and I also think it's gonna have to be really looked at, I mean, so many, so much of birding can be 
you know, going places um, versus staying at home. Um, I think I think right now a lot of people just want to go out and see birds. But I think as as we continue to move forward and climate change becomes more of an issue, some of those things I touched upon, like the ethical going after the, the ethical ramifications of going after birds to see them for our own personal gratification versus the safety and long-term well-being of birds is going to have to be taken into account um, simply because there are going to be so many you know stresses on the environment that we have to to reckon with it's gonna be interesting yeah yeah so just kind of flying to sri lanka to get like 10 more birds on your bird list like in a weekend might not really be very responsible yeah. Okay, cool. Um, it looks like there's a couple um, questions. I have to p post this one because this is my mom. So um, instead of wrapping up uh, here uh, with one more question, I'm going to post this one. It's uh, it's an interesting one. Let's see what you... I like that one. So, yeah. so interestingly, um, from 2018 to about mid-2019, I was living in an indigenous village in Alaska called Huna. Hmm. Uh, so that was is largely my experience with interacting with indigenous people while birding. Um, I, th I think that my experience there is not representative of what it could be if it was um, in another part of this country as a po or even in other, other countries. Um, mm -hmm. But there in, in Huna, um, it's this specific experience was, uh, you know, the, it was a, the, the Klingit were the, the tribe that was mainly on that, on that Island. And their two clans, the, the ravens and the eagles, are birds. So there was this underlying reverence toward eagles and ravens. Um, but the native people were not necessarily birders, but there was this respect for, you know, the, the black leg kittiwakes, the, the duck tetan, the, the seabirds, and, um, you know, wildlife there. And it was interesting to be out there, they're birding, looking at some of these creatures and like seeing the totems, honoring them just, just a few feet away. And I do wonder, you know, that intersection between birding and then these, you know, these cultural identification with these birds, how that would, you know, so how, how to really, how, how the native people there would think about that. There's this great, there's actually a Facebook group, you know, Huna birding. And mm -hmm. it's really cool to see how uh, there's one birder on the island, one of my friends who's not indigenous, but uh, runs a bird tour company there when the tourists come in the summer. And her enthusiasm for birding, like the practice of, as opposed to just this innate reverence of these birds has actually gotten a lot of people on the island actually interested in birding and posting birds mm -hmm. and looking at birds. And I, I have to wonder what it feels like to be indigenous with that respect towards birds culturally and then birding but it was you know in my in my experience it was it was just really great to be in that uh, environment and be able to love birds over here the way i do over here and then be exposed to this ancient you know reverence of birds that you know i could never fully understand but could definitely appreciate and just be wowed by yeah, that's that's really interesting. It seems like there are a lot of different ways of interacting with nature, and sometimes um, in the West um, we imagine that our the the kind of dominant way that we interact with nature is kind of like normal um, or like yeah. So um, thanks for answering that one, and I love your question about or your answer about um, the future of birding. So if people want to like follow you on this, um, I'm sure you can be adding a lot of cool birds and stuff like that. And if people want to um, learn more about what you're up to, um, how can people, what's the best way for people to find out about you? Well, I have a, uh, I have a website, which is drawing 10,000 birds.com, which I try to put uh, a lot of, I work as an educator. So I try to put a bunch of cool stuff for kids to download, like coloring pages and, and cool little fun things to do feel like little field guides. Um, I also have an Instagram, which is also drawing 10,000 birds and a Facebook page, which is also drawing 10,000 birds. Nice. <laughs> I, think I, don't, I don't have your Facebook page on here, but there's the Instagram and I'll put the Facebook also um, in the link below. And like, I'm really excited to see like how this mission like unfolds over the years. Uh, I guess it's going to be a, how many, where are you at right now with it? Yeah, I figured that was an important question to ask. So yeah. uh, just this winter, I saw my 1,000 121st 
bird, which was a blackback woodpecker out in Saxonbog, Minnesota. And I've gotten a little behind on my drawings since I've had to do so many like other jobs during COVID, but I'm up to around 450 something birds. Dang. So I figure as long as I see them all while I'm young, then when I'm older and I might like <laughs> to just and draw all day and it'll all just look uh -huh. up. Cool. Well, um, thank you so much for joining. And I see there's a couple more people that have just joined in the um, chat. Um, thanks everybody for uh, joining in. And Christina, thank you so much. And I wish you the best on your mission. It's such a awesome thing that you're taking on. Well, thank you so much. It's been great to be able to talk to you. I miss talking to to birders and, and artists. So thank you so much for having me here. And, and thanks to so much for everyone for watching and your great questions. And um, yeah, if anyone ever has any questions or anything, I'm more than happy to answer email questions or any nature journaling things you might want to ask or talk about. So yeah, thanks so much. It's been fun. All right, Christina. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.